العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Welcome back to the first. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of your ibadah in Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow all of our deeds that we perform to be accepted. Forgive us for our shortcomings in Ramadan and after Ramadan. Allahumma ameen. So tonight, uh, we're going to be looking into probably one of the most complex companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the entire seerah. Because when you think of him, you always think of him on the opposing side of the Prophet ﷺ. And I have to admit that I was once going to give a khutbah uh, a few years ago. There was someone who was a high profile convert. This was maybe six, seven years ago. And I was thinking to myself, we should name the khutbah the curious case of Abu Sufyan. Because the Prophet ﷺ treats this man in such a way that is so unfathomable when you consider the profile of Abu Sufyan and his enmity towards the Prophet ﷺ for two decades. From the very beginning, all the way until Fatih Mecca, he's not just one enemy of the Prophet ﷺ, he's always the ringleader. He's always there amongst those that are conspiring against the Prophet ﷺ. And it would not be an exaggeration to say that this might have been the most hated man to the Muslims if you think about the cumulative seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. When you said the name of Abu Sufyan in Medina, it evoked a certain sentiment because this was the man that was always organizing against the Prophet ﷺ. And so subhanAllah, as we talk about him, you don't just come to appreciate the end of the story, you come to appreciate the mindset of a man who somehow is won over to the Prophet ﷺ and who somehow the Prophet ﷺ can tolerate despite everything that he's done against Islam. And his history is rich and believe it or not, subhanAllah, this is actually one of the harder uh, lectures to pack into one hour because of the depth of the story of this man, Abu Sufyan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So his name, first and foremost, is Sakhar ibn Harb ibn Umayyah ibn Abdi Shams. So Sakhar is his actual name, which means rock, right? Sakhar ibn Harb, the rock, the son of war. That would be the translation of his name. And subhanAllah, how fitting of a name it actually is to him. His name Abu Sufyan is actually a kunya that his father supposedly had. So there's debate about where he got the name Abu Sufyan from because he doesn't actually have a name or a son named Sufyan, right? So either his father was named Abu Sufyan and he wanted to carry the kunya, the nickname of his father, or Sufyan, which means swiftness. It could mean, mean like a storm, represents a certain character in battle, right? Someone who moves like a storm, or it was a characteristic that Abu Sufyan wanted to be named after. So his name is Sakhr ibn Harb. He has two nicknames, Abu Sufyan, which is his most famous nickname, and then the other Kunya is the one that is actually after his oldest son, which is Abu Hanzala. So his actual technical name is Abu Hanzala, after his oldest son. As I said, the most hated man to the Muslims. And subhanAllah, when you think about the hadith of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the man who killed 99 people from Bani Israel and then killed 100 and still found forgiveness from Allah, this is probably the only man or one of the only people in the seerah that you can pinpoint and say he actually killed a hundred Muslims. And so this hadith actually has to apply to him and he didn't just kill any 99 or 100 people. He killed a hundred of the best people on the face of the earth, the best of the best generation of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yet somehow Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will spare him until the very end and until he has an opportunity to convert to Islam. So he obviously comes from a very powerful family and his reputation in Islam of being a warlord is inherited from his father. So his father, uh, Harb, whose name is War, was actually the leader of Kinana in what's known as Harb al-Fujar, the, the early uh, wars of the days of ignorance, the tribalistic wars. His father was the main leader of Quraysh. And his father is known for being a warlord. And his father is also sort of looked at amongst the generation before him as the successor to Abd al-Muttalib in terms of being the leader of Mecca. So Abu Sufyan is inheriting nobility, is inheriting power. 
He's inheriting war. He's inheriting the responsibility of one of the three arc tribes of Mecca, Banu Abdi Shams. He is being groomed to be the leader, and he's literally a copy of his father. Now, because his father dies before Islam, it's harder to get much information about him, but it seems to be that everything about Abu Sufyan that you learn is true of his father as well. And he comes from this rich, noble, powerful tribe. Banu Abd al-Shams was known not just for their ability in war, but they were known for running the caravans, all of the trade to Asham, right, which, which Abu Sufyan will be famous for. Who, is, who are the richest companions that come to your mind from the Prophet Sallallahu companions? Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu is the cousin of Abu Sufyan. He's also from Banu Abd al-Shams, right? So you think about the aristocrats of Mecca, the people who have all the money, the people who have a concentration of power. Um, his father-in-law is Utbah ibn, uh, ibn Rabi'ah, who's one of the chieftains of Mecca. And we learned quite a bit about him, and he's one of the staunch opponents of the Prophet ﷺ as well. And it's too hard to talk about his whole family because Abu Sufyan had seven wives in total and way too many children to count. So children and grandchildren, plentiful. Uh, seven marriages total. His two most famous wives, the first one is Hind bint Utbah, who we're going to talk about. Hind bint Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Hind being the woman who was famous for what? For chewing the liver of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Right, so this is the wife of Abu Sufyan. And his other um, wife, Safiya bint Abil As, uh, who's the aunt of Uthman and the mother of Um Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Sufyan's sister, I'm not gonna go too much longer in the family tree, I'm just gonna move on inshallah. His sister Arwa is the wife of Abu Lahab. And some of the uh, scholars of tafsir say, الحطب, The woman carrying the wood is actually speaking to uh, the sister of Abu Sufyan, okay, who's the wife of Abu Lahab, right? So one of the wives of Abu Lahab is the sister of Abu Sufyan, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He's known as Rayat al-Ru'asa, alati tusamma al-Uqab, that in the times of war, when the banner was handed to the senior amongst them, when things became difficult and everyone had to retreat, Abu Sufyan is the head of Quraysh, the Amir of Quraysh that the people always retreat to. So he occupies this lofty position in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's also older than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is one of the interesting things that's narrated about him. It's narrated that he was 20 year, he was born 20 years before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he died 20 years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he lives an extremely long life, anywhere from 10 to 20 years older than the Prophet ﷺ. And basically, he was most famous for his caravans, the large amount of trade that he used to do with the world around. So he used to go out to Asham frequently, to Palestine, to Syria uh, frequently. He used to go out to Yemen frequently. He used to run the marketplace of Mecca during the pilgrimage seasons. So when you think about all of the leaders, the Abu Jahls and the Abu Lahabs of the world, Abu Sufyan is the one that kind of has the smarts of the caravans that go out and how the caravans come in. The merchants that come from Yemen and that come from Syria know Abu Sufyan as the point person, and Abu Sufyan knows them when he goes to Yemen and Asham. And he's someone that has a lot to lose when the Prophet ﷺ declares his Islam. Why? Because military power, he's afraid of losing. His wealth, he's afraid, afraid of losing because all of the exploitation, all of the riba, all of the interest and usury and the power that's occupied there. And of course, uh, beyond that, seniority. He's looked at as occupying this point between the eldest of Quraysh, the eldest leaders of Quraysh, and then the younger generation. He's kind of situated between the two generations. And so he's the natural next leader of Quraysh. And as soon as he sees the Prophet Sallallahu declaring Islam, despite knowing everything he knew about the Prophet Sallallahu like Abu Jahl, he immediately thinks, Bani Abd shams Bani Makhzum, Banu Hashim, we can't do it. I'm going to fight you. There is no way that I can concede that you are a prophet of Allah because if I concede that you are a prophet of Allah, then I lose my position. 
This is all just to give you a little bit of a background before we get personal, inshallah ta'ala, in the life of this man, uh, Sakhr ibn Harb, Abu Sufyan, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, what happens? When the Prophet sallallahu announces his prophethood, Abu Sufyan is not someone who takes the immediate violent reaction of Abu Jahl. Abu Sufyan is someone who's trying to think of the most diplomatic way to strategically undermine the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that speaks to a little bit of his mind, right? He's a lot less volatile than Abu Jahl is. So he's not someone that you see pouncing on the Muslims, pouncing on the Prophet ﷺ, suddenly pulling out his sword and fighting people. He's someone who's constantly planning in the background and scheming as to how to stop Islam from growing in Mecca. And they used to say that the three wise men of Quraysh who all became idiots when Islam came to Mecca, Abu Jahl, whose name was Abu al-Hakam, the father of wisdom, Utbah, the father-in-law of Abu Sufyan, and Abu Sufyan, they all took, subhanAllah, things that were completely opposite of what their stances would have been in the days of ignorance in regards to the Prophet So everything was counterintuitive about how they responded to the Prophet But still, in keeping true to his character, he's someone who schemes against the Prophet And he's someone who will incite the violence but who rarely be actually seen holding the sword and actually uh, abusing people in public, because he's kind of trying to maintain a reputation. He's also someone that continues his trade routes even during the first several years of Islam. So many of the, the Meccans go on high alert, right? They're like, we have, to, we have to solve this rebellion from the inside and squash this message. Abu Sufyan still goes to Yemen, he still goes to Asham, he still carries on growing his business and growing his trade while he's scheming against the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. Now one of the things that happens is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests each and every single one of these men by someone of their own family, their closest relatives, becoming Muslim in the earliest batch. So his daughter, Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha, is considered to be the second person from Banu Umayyah to embrace Islam after Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anha. She's the second from the tribe to embrace Islam. She's one of as al-awwalun, one of the first Muslims, his own daughter. And this caused a lot of trouble to Abu Sufyan. It was embarrassing to him. Now she's married to Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, so she's not technically living with him, but it's still a huge embarrassment that his own daughter would embrace the Prophet Sallallahu message at a very early point of the call to Islam. And of course, his own daughter, as well as his cousin Uthman, are both amongst those that migrate to Abyssinia to escape the persecution of Mecca. So Abu Sufyan's daughter embraces Islam, along with her husband, along with her cousin Uthman. They flee the persecution of the likes of Abu Sufyan and Utbah and others uh, taking place in Mecca. Now Abu Sufyan, this is to give you some important context to the Battle of Badr, to him, all of the wealth of the Muslims was fair game, including his own family. So once his own relatives go to Abyssinia, he confiscates their homes, he sells their homes, he includes it amongst his caravan. So he's actively stealing the wealth of the Muslims, including his own relatives, and consuming that and making it part of his caravan and ba basically making his caravan larger and larger and larger and larger. The reason why this is so important is that when you get to the Battle of Badr, it all starts with the caravan of Abu Sufyan, right? And you can imagine what precious wealth is in the caravan of Abu Sufyan, who shows no regard for the wealth of the Muslims, including uh, his own uh, in-laws. And there's a very famous uh, story about Abu Ahmad Abd ibn Jahsh and his home, uh, which was considered one of the best of Mecca. And he was a blind man, his home being stolen from him, sold and then included in the caravan, the money being included in the caravan of Abu Sufyan. So he takes these caravans and how does Abu Sufyan basically save face? So I want to give you just this, this high level. When you read about the munafiqun, I'm sorry, when you read about the kuffar, the disbelievers of Mecca spending money in charity and expecting a reward, it's usually talking about Abu Sufyan. 
Because the way Abu Sufyan covers for all this exploitation and the way that he covers for all of the stealing and all of this abuse with his wealth is that he gives a lot of money in charity, right? He finances many of the military endeavors and the tribal endeavors of Quraysh. He does a lot that earns him face amongst his people, but subhanAllah, all of it is being spent fi sabida shaitan, in the way of the devil, right? And to actually oppress and to actually harm. Now with all of that, Abu Sufyan comes to learn that his daughter, Um Habiba, receives a marriage proposal from the Prophet ﷺ. Think about this marriage. Because Um Habiba's husband dies in Habasha. And we talked about her ta'ala anha already in this series. Um Habiba is in Abyssinia, a widow. The Prophet ﷺ is in Medina. Abu Sufyan is in Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ sends a marriage proposal to Um Habiba in Abyssinia. The news of that reaches Abu Sufyan, who's trying to kill the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. Talk about an international, like this is before Zoom Nikahs were even a thing. Like this is all happening international across borders in very different political climates. But to give you an idea of the mindset of Abu Sufyan and the way that he thinks and how tribalistic of a man that he was, when he heard that Um Habiba received a marriage proposal from the Prophet Sallallahu he said the words, al la yuqra'u anfu that that is a noble stallion who should not be rejected. You know what? I'm trying to kill the man, and I can't stand him, but at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ comes from a noble lineage, and so at the end of the day, my daughter is marrying someone from a noble lineage. I'm okay with this. I'm still going to try to kill him, but I'm okay with this. At the end of the day, my daughter is in good hands now. She's now part of, uh, again, the continuation of a noble lineage. So he's got a very strange tribalistic mindset, and he enters into this arena of opposition to the Prophet ﷺ, from these very base places, right? It's not like a, a noble type of opposition, right? It's tribe and money, tribe and money, tribe and money. Now, after the Prophet ﷺ escapes and flees to Mecca, this is where the story now really starts to take shape. Abu Sufyan is still now in the second tier of the main opposition to the Prophet because his elders are still alive, right? So Abu Jahl is still alive, Abu Lahab is still alive, Utbah is still alive, Umayyah is still alive, Al-Walid al mughira is still alive, Al-As is still alive, right? These are still sort of the, the elders to Abu, Jah, uh, to Abu Sufyan that are opposing the Prophet Abu Sufyan is in their group, but he's still slightly younger than them. The Prophet وسلم, as he flees to Medina, he commissions these raids on the caravans to try to intercept some of what was stolen from the Muslims. And so as the caravans are going out to Asham and as they're going out to Yemen and they're returning, the Prophet ﷺ is trying to intercept some of those caravans. So what happens with the Battle of Badr? The Prophet ﷺ comes to know about the caravan of Abu Sufyan returning back to Mecca. And the caravan of Abu Sufyan had a thousand camels and over 50,000 dinars worth of goods. It had much of the consumed and stolen wealth of the Muslims. And so the Prophet ﷺ sends a battalion, not an army, a battalion, to try to intercept that, which, which explains why you had such a small number of people on the side of the Muslims that weren't equipped for a battle when Badr happened. They didn't have camels, they didn't have horses, they didn't have their full armor. They had things that could keep them light in the desert, right? While well, they tried to intercept the caravan of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan hears about the plan of the Prophet So he diverts his caravan, his huge caravan, and he has 40 guards to that caravan. So you can see how much he treasures that wealth. So you got a whole army of sorts protecting the caravan, and he takes a different route he alerts Abu Jahl and the leaders of Mecca, and then they go out to meet the Prophet ﷺ and that small group of Muslims around the area of Badr. And that's how the Battle of Badr is going to take place, right? So Abu Sufyan escapes the Battle of Badr technically because his job is to actually safeguard his caravan from the Prophet ﷺ and from the Muslims before the Battle of Badr. However, most of the leaders 
of Quraysh are present in the Battle of Badr. Some of them didn't want to go out, including, by the way, the father-in-law of the Prophet, the father-in-law of Abu Sufyan himself, Utbah. He really didn't feel like it, but Abu Jahl was insisting. In fact, you have narrations of Abu Sufyan saying, look, we've got the caravan safe. There's no need to, to engage in battle now. Abu Jahl is the one who's insisting on trying to wipe out the Muslims while we have them vulnerable. So Abu Sufyan, his job was to protect the caravan. Abu Jahl is shaming the other leaders to go to battle with the Prophet and to take advantage of the situation and to kill their own sons, right, in this battle, and has a vengeance to him that everyone else is just kind of going along with. Abu Sufyan's not participating. However, his oldest son, Hamdallah, and another one of his sons participates in the Battle of Badr, as well as his father-in-law and essentially all of his in-laws uh, from the side of Hind bint Utbah. Now I want you to think of the commencement of the Battle of Badr. As the Battle of Badr is getting started, if you remember, in the beginning of the battle, there is a duel. The duel that starts off the Battle of Badr, where you have three Muslims come forward, and three of the opposing side come forward, the duel on their side includes the family, all three of them are the family of Abu Sufyan's in-laws. You have Utbah bin Rabi'ah, his father-in-law. You have Shayba, the brother of Utbah. And you have uh, Walid, I'm sorry, yeah, Walid. So you have Walid ibn Utbah, Shayba, and Utbah. All of them are from the same family coming out to fight the Muslims. And between Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Ubaidah radiallahu anhu, they finish all three of them. Okay, so all three of them are killed in that battle. Meaning that by the time Hind hears this, you can understand now where that vengeance is coming against Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that you killed my father and you killed my brother. Right? She wants revenge on Hamza because Hamza radiallahu anhu technically is the one who killed her father and her brother in those duels. As for Abu Sufyan himself, his oldest son, Hamdala, died as a, as a kafir on that day. He died as a disbeliever fighting the Muslims that day. So he's one of the casualties on the side of the mushrikeen. He had another son who the Prophet ﷺ had as a prisoner, but the Prophet ﷺ let him go. So he's one of the captives of Badr who was let go. All the captives, of course, were let go at some ransom in hopes that it would soften the hearts of the people of Mecca. It didn't soften the heart of Abu Sufyan or Hind at all, right? That his other son was let go, even though the aggression was coming from their side. Hence comes the Battle of Uhud. Now the first war, the first battle that Abu Sufyan is going to appear as the leader, the absolute leader of, is the Battle of Uhud. He's going to lead Uhud against the Prophet Sallallahu and he's going to lead Khandaq, the siege of Medina, in the Battle of the Trench against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he is the core leader, the supreme leader of both of those battles because everyone else that was of that level had already perished in Badr. So all of his colleagues, all of those that were at his level or senior to him had died in the Battle of Badr. And now they are coming to Uhud with a sense of pure vengeance and hatred towards the Prophet ﷺ. And there is none that has more hatred in her heart than Hind bint Utbah, than his wife Hind, who wants revenge for the murder of her father and the murder of her brother. I mean, she's the one bringing out the women to the battlefield. She's got the war drum. She's authoring poetry, right? Basically saying to the men that if you lose this battle, then don't come home. Right? then we will not accept you back into our homes if you flee from this battlefield. She is the one who is leading the group of the insiders right? uh, in the battle of Uhud and demanding the mutilation of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, specifically Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu and she's the one that promises Wahshi his freedom if he kills Hamza and brings to Hamza the, uh, or brings to her the liver of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu so that she could chew the liver of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu as an act of humiliation. Subhanallah, 
as this battle takes place, I want you to just imagine the qadr of Allah because when we talk about like, why me? There's a lot of why me's in the family of Abu Sufyan. Both Abu Sufyan and Hind almost got killed on the day of Uhud. SubhanAllah how Allah spared them. As for Hind, if you remember the story of Abu Dujana radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when Abu Dujana radiallahu anhu cut across the battlefield, he made it so quickly through the lines of the disbelievers that he got all the way to the women that were beating the drums and singing the song and he was cutting so fast and slicing so fast he ended up and he said, I had my sword right on top of a woman and she gasped. <gasps> and Zubair is watching this whole thing and she was singing the lines of incitement and who was it? Hind bint Utbah. And Abu Dujana had his sword then he pulled the sword back. Subhanallah, as Zubair, and, and by the way, she's an active participant in this battle, if you think about it. She's going around beating the drums, telling the men to go forward and to kill. And you're in a moment of, of, of heat. As Zubair asked Abu Dujana what happened, and he said that when I reached her, or when I was going through, and I realized that it was a woman that was under me, فَأَكْرَمْتُ سَيْفَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ and أَضْرَبِ بِهِ امرأة. I found the sword of the Prophet وسلم, too noble to use it to strike a woman. I wasn't going to use the sword of the Prophet وسلم, to strike a woman. So he spared her. Now you would hope that that would have softened her heart a bit, right? It didn't. The vengeance was still consuming her. And subhanAllah, it was her, and it was the wife of Amr ibn As, and it was the wife of Ikram ibn Abi Jahl, and all of these women who would become Muslim one day, who were beating the drums, and calling for the body parts of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ in revenge for those that were killed in the battle of Badr. So Hind survives due to an act of nobility from a Zubair. I'm sorry, from Abu Dujana radiallahu ta'ala anhu. As for Abu Sufyan, subhanAllah, it's actually really interesting. The very famous Hamdala, Hamdala ibn Abi Amr, who's known as Ghasir al-Malaika, the one who the angels washed, the very famous Hanbala, the young man radiallahu anhu, he actually got to Abu Sufyan on the battlefield and he managed to knock him off of his horse. And he was just about to kill him, but then Shaddad ibn Aswad killed him from behind. So Abu Sufyan was on his back about to die on the day of Uhud. And what a miserable fate it would have been, right? And instead, Allah spared him. Hanbala radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was martyred and Hamdala was taken up to the heavens and washed. And by the way, in, a, in SubhanAllah, the, the irony continues. The son of Hamdala that was born from that night, meaning this, you know, his wife was pregnant that night. The son of Hamdala that was born would later on go on to be martyred by the grandson of Abu Sufyan, Yazid ibn, ibn Muawiyah. So it's just the twist of fate <laughs> happening over and over again, right? So Hind was under the sword of Abu Dujana, Abu Sufyan was on his back, Hamdala over him, and both of them somehow, by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, survived that day. Right? As time goes on, as Uhud commences, Abu Sufyan was commanding the middle, Ikrama on the right, Khalid on the left, and we know that Khalid radiallahu ta'ala anhu was able to uh, carry out the defeat of the Muslims with his strategy. After that massacre of the companions takes place. The most famous conversation after Uhud is between Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu and Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan chanting with Khalid and Ikrama and Amr ibn Aas calling out and asking while the Prophet ﷺ is covered in blood and barely alive, Afil qawmi Muhammad, is Muhammad amongst you? And the Prophet ﷺ says, La tujibu, don't answer him. Afil qawmi ibn Abi Quhafa, is Abu Bakr amongst them? The Prophet ﷺ says, don't answer. Afil qawmi Umar, is Umar amongst them? The Prophet ﷺ says, don't answer. Abu Sufyan celebrates. That means we killed them. That means we, we won. We won, we killed Muhammad ﷺ, we killed Abu Bakr, we killed Umar. And that's when Umar responds and says, Kadabta ya adu Allah, qad, amkal, qad abqa Allah ma yukhzik. You've lied, O enemy of Allah. Allah has preserved that which causes you disgrace. And that's when the, 
the slogan starts to come out. And Abu, uh, Abu Sufyan calls out to Umar, and he says, لَنَا الْعُزَّةِ وَلَا عُزَّةِ لَكُمْ We have Uzza and you have no Uzza. We have Lat. We have, he starts to call out the names of their gods. Prophet says, respond and say, Allahu Mawlana wa la Mawla lakum. Allah is our protector, you have no protector. U'lu Hubal. He's calling out, may Hubal be exalted. The Prophet says to Umar radiallahu anhu, respond to him and say, Allahu A'la wa Ajal. Allah is higher and more exalted. Abu Sufyan says, a day for a day, our dead for your dead. The Prophet says, you can respond and say, your dead are in the fire, our dead are in paradise. So Abu Sufyan is flustered and frustrated on the battlefield because we're supposed to win here, but this doesn't feel like a win. Right? The Muslims still have such moral clarity, it doesn't feel like a win. And subhanAllah, he survives the battle of Uhud. As for Hind, she carries out that despicable act. And I just want you to think about that, subhanAllah. Sayyid al-Shuhada. The master of the martyrs on the Day of Judgment, Hind is the one who had his chest cut open, who took his liver, who chewed his liver and spit it out. And subhanAllah, she dies a Muslim. <laughs> we talk about people meeting in Jannah. What a meeting, right? Aren't you the woman, you know, subhanAllah, that, that chewed out? The, Allah, Allah knows best. This is how the Qadr of Allah works, right? People that repent and redeem themselves later on. In any case, after Uhud, I'm, I'm actually, if, if you think about it, all of these stories have showed up in different Sahaba, but when you put it all together in a narrative, they weren't satisfied. The Mushrikeen weren't satisfied. They wanted more, more vengeance, right? And so you had the massacres of Ma'una and the massacres of ar rajir the massacres of more companions that were ambushed than the total companions that were martyred in Uhud. Abu Sufyan is the one who is torturing Khubayb ibn Adi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And as he's being crucified and he's being cut limb by limb and the blood is dripping from him, Abu Sufyan says, bring him down. Let me ask him a question. Think about Abu Sufyan, psychological torture, and he stands in front of Khubayb and he says to him, if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa could be in your place right now, would you accept it? Wouldn't you rather that instead of you taking this beating and, and being cut up into pieces like this, wouldn't you like that Muhammad sallallahu be in your place? And Khubayb said to him, Wallahi, I would not even accept a thorn pricking the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in place of what I'm going through right now. Abu Sufyan, he said, Wallahi ma ra'aytu min nasi ahadan yuhibbu ahadan ka hubbi ashabi Muhammadin Muhammadah. So I've never seen a man in my life who is loved the way that Muhammad وسلم, is loved by his companions. I don't get it. This doesn't make sense. Meaning if you, if you kind of follow the logic of Abu Sufyan, all of what he thought he knew in terms of how human beings and societies function is falling apart. In the aftermath of Uhud, we were supposed to win, but we didn't win. We really didn't feel like we won. I'm torturing this man and breaking him down. He's being cut up into pieces and crucified. And he still has this clarity and it drives him crazy. What is it about you? And Muawiyah, who was a child at the time, he says that when Khubayb made the dua, Allahumma ahslihim adada wa qtulhum badada wa la tughadir minhum ahada, oh Allah, count them and kill them all one by one and don't spare a single one of them. Muawiyah says, Abu Sufyan, my father, because I was a kid, he threw me to the ground, to my back, and he lay down on his back. Worried about something coming down from the heavens to strike him. That was the power of the dua that was made against him. Somehow he survives. He doesn't wake up. SubhanAllah, look at the stubbornness that takes place. Abu Sufyan is in Mecca. Abu Jahl is gone. Abu Lahab is gone. All of them are gone. He is the one who now says... Let us lead a siege on Medina. And let's end this once and for all. So Abu Sufyan is the leader of this effort now to carry out a genocide in Medina, to, to remove the Muslims from the face of the earth and wipe them all out. He is the one who's galvanizing the Bedouin tribes, 
galvanizing all of the Meccans, and he says, I will personally put all of my wealth on this. Whatever it costs, we have it. And that's the thing, he was being praised for his sadaqah, how ironic, he was being praised for his charity in Mecca. Look at how noble Abu Sufyan is, he puts his money where his mouth is, right? Puts all of his personal money into this noble effort of trying to wipe out this group of people. So Abu Sufyan leads the largest army in the history of the Arabs against Medina and places Medina under siege for that month of tribulation. SubhanAllah, in this, by the way, uh, there's something to pay, to pay attention to, which is that his daughter was not in Medina. She was still in Abyssinia, right? So that's something to keep in mind here. The second thing is, uh, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman has the narration about how difficult things are becoming. So you're always getting this peak of Abu Sufyan on the other side as he's leading these efforts against the Prophet Hudayfa was the one, radiallahu anhu, who the Prophet ﷺ commissioned to go and to find out what they were planning as the dua of the Prophet ﷺ for wind to blow upon them and for difficulty to come upon them was making it too difficult for the army from Mecca to survive outside of the trench. Eventually the frustration was growing. So Hudayfa was sent on this mission to basically go and spy and to get the news. And it was a very difficult mission. So he goes out at night and he pretends to be one of the Meccans. So he crosses the ditch, pretends to be one of the Meccans and he says, فَقَامَ أَبُوْ Sufyan ibn Harb. Abu Sufyan stood up and Abu Sufyan was a large man. Huge man. Huge in his posture. Right? Similar to the, the way that Abu Jahl is described and Khalid is described, radiallahu anhu. He has a huge posture. And he has a booming voice. And he says that Abu Sufyan stood up. And so I, you know, I, I looked as if I'm receiving orders. I'm in the ranks of the mushrikeen. And he said, يَا مَعْشَرَ Quraysh." Every one of you, check the person that's next to you. He had a sense that he was infiltrated. Abu Sufyan's smart. He's like, something feels off about this gathering. We've got, a, we've got a spy in the gathering. So Abu Sufyan says with a booming voice, everyone check the person that's next to you. So Hudayfa, he's smart. He says, He said, so I took the man next to me and I said, Man ant, man ant, who are you? Who are you? I started shaking up the man next to me. And I shook him up so much that he didn't even ask me who I was. Like I, I said it with such confidence in my voice that I was one of them. Who are you? Tell me who you are. So Abu Sufyan, he asked, he said, are we all clear? Everyone said, we're all clear. So Hudayfa said, subhanAllah, and this is so, so much. He said, and then I had a clean shot of Abu Sufyan. Like I was standing right next to him and I could have killed him. And he said, and I thought about it. But then I remember that the Prophet ﷺ said, don't cause any commotion. So he said, I went back and forth with myself because I was there. I crossed and I was right next to him. I could have easily just taken him out right then and there. SubhanAllah, another time, your life is right there. And he said, no, but I remember the Prophet ﷺ said, don't cause a skirmish. So he said, you know, I decided to put my weapons away, cross back the khandaq. I came back and he said that I was absolutely exhausted. I went back to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet was, was in salah, he was praying, and the Prophet threw me a shawl, basically as a blanket, right? And he said that I immediately, I wrapped myself in the shawl of the Prophet I knocked out, I went to sleep, and the Prophet woke me up and said, Qum ya no man, get up sleepy head, wake up. No man was literally a gnome, you know, he's, he was uh, making fun of his name, وسلم, but basically as a means of lightening it up, right? And, Telling, tell me what happened. So Hudayfa explained to the Prophet ﷺ what happened with Abu Sufyan. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I had a clean shot. But you told me not to cause commotion, so I left him. So Abu Sufyan survived Badr because he was protecting the caravan. He survived Uhud on his back. He survived the dua of Khubayb. He survived Khandaq right in the reach of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. Allah is clearly sparing this man for a reason. Because otherwise, his fate should be like the fate of everybody else. Why is all of this happening? Then comes afterwards, obviously, Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So he's led these two attempts to wipe out the Prophet ﷺ. It didn't work, right? At least not a total wipeout of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions. Sulh Hudaybiyah happens, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, 
And when the Treaty of Hudaybiyah happens, it gives Abu Sufyan a chance to basically resume his caravans, and the Prophet allows him to resume his da'wah. Right? So the, the peace treaty allows the Prophet him to send his letters to different parts of the world to do da'wah, and Abu Sufyan is going to take a break from war, or so he thinks, he's going to take a break from battle, and get back into his wealth, get back into trading. Right? We have a, a truce for now. So Abu Sufyan, he tells this story. He says, so I went on, and this is in Al-Bukhari, it's actually one of the first ahadith that you find in Sahih Al-Bukhari, the book of faith, in the, in the beginning of Revelation. He says that I got to Jerusalem, and subhanAllah, as he arrived at Jerusalem with his companions, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate Al-Quds, Allahumma ameen, Haraqil, who was the leader of Rome, had just received the letter of the Prophet ﷺ calling him to Islam, and it caused him panic. Why? Because Hiraqil saw a dream that indicated that the Prophet had come, and he was a devout Christian, and that the son of the circumcised one had come, meaning someone who's reviving the way of Ibrahim ﷺ, and things had just settled down with the Persians, so the Romans just defeated the Persians, they'd recovered their city, they'd recovered their cross, they'd recovered all of their sort of heiba, their nobility. And now he receives this letter calling him to Islam. And it really startles him because it coincides with the dream that he has. And on top of that, it happened to be in trading season. So Hiraqr says, is anyone here from Mecca? So they said, Abu Sufyan just showed up with his two companions. So Hiraqr says, bring them to me. So Abu Sufyan thinks he's getting a break from all of what's happening right now. He's pulled to the court of Heracl, of Heraclius. And Heraclius says, which one of you is the closest to the man who claims to be the prophet? So Abu Sufyan says, in terms of lineage, it's me. I'm technically a distant cousin of the prophet وسلم, of Muhammad وسلم. So Heracl says, uh, come here, stand in front of me. And he told the companions of Abu Sufyan, come, back, come behind him, stand behind him. I'm going to ask him some questions. If he tells a lie, let me know. I'm going to take his head off. So you're going to tell me the truth. You guys are going to make sure that he's telling the truth or else he's dead, right? So Abu Sufyan has to tell the truth about the Prophet Sallallahu or else he risks death. So he's like, if it wasn't for the fact that these two men behind me might actually indicate that I told a lie, then I would have said some things differently about Muhammad Wasallam. but I had to be honest. So he says that the questioning then commenced, so he asked me, and it's a long hadith, uh, I won't go into the details because it in and of itself is a beautiful uh, narration. What is his family status amongst you? And Abu Sufyan said he belongs to a noble family amongst us. Heraclius says, has anyone amongst you ever claimed to be the same before him? Abu Sufyan says, no. Uh, has anyone from his, was anyone from his ancestors a king? No. Heraclius says, who follows him? The elite ones or the, the downtrodden? Abu Sufyan says, it's the downtrodden. And he said, are his followers increasing or decreasing? Abu Sufyan says, but yes, he doing? They're increasing. <laughs> like he's having to swallow every single answer. He has to just say what it is. And he says, and subhanAllah, this is so powerful. He said, does anyone leave his religion out of being dissatisfied with his religion after faith enters into their heart? Meaning, it's understandable if you persecute people out of Islam, like you fight people until they leave Islam, or you make it so difficult that some people leave Islam. But are you finding mass apostasy amongst them because the religion just didn't turn out to be what we thought it was? I said, no. Everyone that's becoming Muslim is staying Muslim. Right? In fact, despite the persecution, they're insisting more. And Heraclius says, have you ever accused him of telling lies before he made the claim to prophethood? He said, no, we knew him as a sadiq al-ameen. He was tr trustworthy and truthful. Never told a lie. Did he ever break promises before? Nope, he never broke a promise. So he said that with all of that, you know, what is it? He said, well, right now, subhanAllah, this is really interesting. So he never broke a promise. So Abu Sufyan thought of something. He said, but right now we have a sulh, we have a truce, and we still don't know how he's going to behave with that truce. So he might break this promise. So we still have to wait to see. The verdict is still out um, on him. And Heraclius says, have you ever had a war with him? You ever been to battle with him? 
Abu Sufyan said, yes. Haraqil said, uh, what happened with those battles? He said, sometimes he's victorious and sometimes we are victorious. And Haraqil said, and what does he command you to do? He said, he tells us to worship Allah and Allah alone and to renounce the way of our uh, ancestors. And he orders us to pray, to speak the truth, to be modest, to keep good relations with our families. And so Heraclius, he's asking the translator to basically give him. So there's a, a mutarjam, there's a translator between him and Abu Sufyan. And as he's getting all of this, Heracl goes back and based on his theology, his understanding of Christianity, he basically says all 10 ways that you just answered prove to me that he's a prophet of Allah. So he went one by one and he said, I asked you this and you answered this way. And this is the way of a prophet. So you could look up the long hadith of Abu Sufyan and Heraclius. The point is, at the end of it, Abu Sufyan said that, I told the two guys that were with me, I said, the way of Muhammad is becoming so compelling, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that he's got kings of the Romans afraid of him. Like he's become the conversation. We thought this was just an affair between us and the desert. But he's got the kings of Rome talking about him. And he said, at that moment, فَمَا زِلْتُ مُوقِنًا أَنَّهُ سَيَظْهَرُ حَتَّى أَدْخَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيَّ الْإِسْلَامِ He said, I knew from that day that he was going to attain victory until the day that Allah would enter me into Islam. Like, that's when I kind of knew that this was not going to go well for me. SubhanAllah, what ends up happening? Who broke the treaty? The Meccans or the Prophet The Meccans broke the treaty of Hudaybiyah. And Abu Sufyan is a smart man. And he recognizes that the Prophet's ummah has grown because in this period of da'wah, so many more people have become Muslim. Uh, we can't afford to go to battle with the Muslims right now. This isn't the same Muslim community from the year before, right? They've grown. There are thousands that have been added to their ranks. So Abu Sufyan wants to salvage the truce even though it was an allied tribe to him that attacked an allied tribe to the Muslims and broke the truce. So he panics and that's when he comes begging and he starts going to different people. He tries to speak to the Prophet and the Prophet turns away from him. Abu Bakr turns away from him. Umar turns away from him. Khalid and Amr, his two former companions, turn away from him. Like you're not getting it yet. You're not waking up yet to the reality of Islam. He tries with Fatima. Fatima has nothing to do with him. He's going and he's pleading with people, but he's trying to use the same diplomacy. And the Muslims in Medina don't have the appetite for it anymore. It's like, look, we're not doing this anymore. We're not playing this game with you anymore. So then he went to Um Habiba, his daughter. Because remember, after Khandaq and Khaybar, the Muslims from Abyssinia came to Medina. So he's going to meet his daughter for the first time in almost 15 years. She fled persecution that he was part of. And he knocks on the door, and Um Habiba is sitting in her home, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and she's sitting on the mattress, the one mattress that they had in the house of the Prophet sallallahu and she quickly folds it up and she sits on it. Meaning you, you, you're not sitting on this mattress. So he says, Ya Bunayati, Aragipti bihal al firashi anni aw bi anhu. Is it too noble for me or am I too noble for it? Like what's going on here? Why can't I sit like you on this thing? And she said, This is the bed of the Prophet. And you're not worthy of sitting on the same bed as the, as the one of the Prophet. SubhanAllah to her own father. Talk about a slap in the face. Like you're talking about nobility and you know, trying to preserve something of your dignity and trying to preserve your honor. Your own daughter says, you're not worthy to sit on the bed of the Prophet And he's realizing, SubhanAllah, that it's not just Khubayb, it's not just Haraqal, it's not just a few of these Muslims, his own daughter. This affair of Islam is growing to a point that it becomes completely irresistible. Now, Umm Habiba, by the way, they said that the longest two sajdas that she made were the day that her father and her brother became Muslim. So she loved her father and, and will find a relationship that returns after Abu Sufyan becomes Muslim. But right now, Abu Sufyan is rejected. He comes back to Mecca. And basically, the Prophet is making plans for Fatih Mecca in Ramadan. And he really knows that he doesn't stand a chance. At that point, 
he goes to his old friend, Al-Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Al-Abbas is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu He hid his Islam for many years. It's un- uncertain when he actually embraced Islam, publicly embraced Islam, but he lived in Mecca. He's involved in the marketplace. He has an old relationship with Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan comes to Al-Abbas and he's confiding in Al-Abbas that he's basically running out of options. Al-Abbas is telling him, listen, just embrace Islam and give it up. Just stop. Like you've gone too long. Allah has given you too many chances. Stop. It's time for you to wake up. It's time for you to embrace Islam. You're still not getting it. But Abu Sufyan still is plotting, still trying to find a way to intercept, to salvage, to preserve. So the Prophet ﷺ is talking to Al-Abbas عنه, as he's camping on the outskirts of Mecca, as he's making preparations to enter into Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ tells Al-Abbas ta'ala anhu that, you know, invite Abu Sufyan to your house, let him stay with you, and then when the morning comes, bring him to me. Bring Abu Sufyan to me. So Al-Abbas says that Abu Sufyan came to my home, he spent the night in my home, and then I told him, let's go see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. let's go see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam." So he says, so when we got to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saw Abu Sufyan, he said, وَيْحَكَ يَا أَبَ سُفْيَانَ Woe to you, O Abu Sufyan! أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لَكَ أَن تَعْلَمَ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Isn't it time for you to realize that there is no God but Allah? Isn't it time for you to figure this out? Come on, enough! Isn't it time for you to realize La ilaha illallah? So Abu Sufyan responded to the Prophet He said, Bi abi anta wa ummi. Kindness. He said, By my father, or may my father and mother be sacrificed for you. Ma ahlamak, wa akramak, wa awsalak. What a noble and kind man that you are. Right? He's praising the Prophet Sallallahu manners. And he says, Wallahi laqad dhanantu, an law kana ma'allahi ilahan ghayru, laqad aghna anni shay'an ba'd. He said, you know, at this point, to be honest with you, I'm starting to think that if Allah had, an, if there was another God besides Allah, He probably would have helped me by now. All this plotting and planning and trying to save these idols and trying to fight you with these idols. So He's basically telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, "Look, as for La Ilaha Illallah, it's making sense to me now. I'm starting to get it that you have one God that is guiding you to this path." Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, "Wey hakiya Abu Sufyan, alam yaani laka an taalam anni Rasulullah." Woe to you, Abu Sufyan. Isn't it time for you to realize that I am the Messenger of Allah? And he says, Amma hadihi fa inna fi nafsi minha hatta al ana shay'ah. He said, Listen, to be honest with you, until now, it's not settling with me. So he's still being stubborn with the Prophet. He's saying, Till now, I can't say it. Al Abbas, he says to him, Waylaka ya Abu Sufyan, Waylaka ya Abu Sufyan. He said, Just go ahead and become Muslim. He says, قَبْلَ أَن تُضْرَبَ عُنُقَكَ Before your neck gets struck, right? Because Al-Abbas recognizes that this situation is tense and he doesn't know what the Prophet ﷺ is planning to do in terms of forgiveness, right? This general amnesty. But like, you fought him so much, you've committed so much harm. Come on, stop. Just say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So in any case, Abu Sufyan said it. But he still wasn't really there. He said it just in the situation. But in his mind, in his heart, he's still plotting. He's still, I'm not really there yet. So he kind of said it in a moment of just the situation and to save himself in the situation. Al-Abbas calls the Prophet Sallallahu He says, Ya Rasulullah, Inna Aba Sufyan, Rajulun yuhibbu al-fakhr. Faj'al lahu shay'a. This is a really... Like, subhanAllah, if I could say that there's one lecture that uh, people of da'wah and leaders need to understand, and honestly, as a community, who's redeemable and who's not, this is a really important lesson here. Prophet Sallallahu could say, the heck with him, I'm done with him anyway. Who's gonna t- what are the repercussions if I do away with him? And Abbas is saying, Ya Rasulullah, Abu Sufyan likes to be praised, yuhibbu al-fakhr, like he likes to be recognized in a gathering. So he says, give him something, like throw him a bone as you're coming into Mecca, so that he can feel better about this entire situation. The Prophet ﷺ could say, A'udhu Billah. This man fought the Muslims, he killed Muslims, he's an enemy of Allah. I don't care about his feelings. Why do I care about his feelings? It's the day of victory. 
But the Prophet takes it into consideration. He says, okay, <laughs> for the sake of Allah, for the sake of Islam, for that bigger picture, I'll do it. Even though this is technically, isn't it playing to some, a, a disease in his heart? I mean, it's pride. But there's a bigger play here. If I win over Abu Sufyan, that's going to dramatically change the tensions in Mecca. The Prophet Sallallahu is after the heart of Abu Sufyan and he's looking to the bigger picture. He's not going to succumb to that moment. And someone, a young person out of purity, might say to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi right? A'udhu Billah, how could you? Ya Rasulullah, why are you showing respect to Abu Sufyan? Forget Abu Sufyan. Isn't that the whole context of like, why are you giving the spoils of war to these people in Mecca? Why don't you treat these elites of Mecca the way that they treated us? This, this, and that. Prophet Sallallahu says, fine. And until the last moment, Abu Sufyan is still not sure. And he still kind of got it in him and Abbas is saying to him, woe to you, Abu Sufyan. Stop. Right? Admit it. Come to terms with this. He is Rasulullah. Then the Prophet وسلم, says, as he's coming into Mecca, the famous words, مَنْ دَخَلَ دَارَ أَبِي سُفْيَانَ فَهُوَ آمِنْ وَمَنْ دَخَلَ الْمَسْجِدْ فَهُوَ آمِنْ وَمَنْ أَغْلَقَ عَلَيْهِ بَابَهُ فَهُوَ آمِنْ This is the announcement of the Prophet ﷺ. Whoever enters into the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. And whoever enters into the haram is safe. And whoever closes his door is safe. Can you imagine Abu Sufyan like, whoa. (laughs) Think about that recognition. Wait, he recognized me like that? So the Prophet ﷺ said that to him. Al-Abbas is saying to him, give it up. Stop. Right? Allah spared you and gave you an opportunity. Now, subhanAllah, if you think about how many tensions the Prophet has to, has to navigate here because this is not just about attaining a military victory. While this is happening, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, from the Ansar, one of the greatest of the Ansar, he's walking in and he has the banner. And he says, Al-yawma yawmul malhama. Al-yawma yawmul malhama. Today is the day of slaughter. Today is the day of revenge. Al-yawma tustahallu al-ka'ba. Today... We will make halal the Kaaba, meaning we're going to come back and we're going to do to these people what they did to us. Abu Sufyan complains to the Prophet ﷺ about that. What does the Prophet ﷺ do? He doesn't say, your problem, not mine. Abu Sufyan takes the banner away from Sa'ad ibn Ubad that today is a day of mercy. Today is not a day of slaughter. Today is a day that the Kaaba is honored. Today is not a day that the Kaaba is made halal. No, no, this is not what we're doing today. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, and remember the name, because Sa'ad ibn Ubadah is one of the earliest Ansar. He, has that, he could have been a Khalifa of the Muslims, by the way. He has the banner taken away from him. And the Prophet وسلم, is easing the tensions. There's another, or there are several skirmishes that take place. Abu Sufyan still has a lot of jahl, a lot of ignorance in him, the way he's going to act. Bilal radiallahu anhu gets up on the Kaaba. Abu Sufyan is like, I, you, know, I, I, I'm not, you know how they, they have that, uh, that saying, if I speak... <laughs> he says, I'm not going to say anything because if I do, the heavens and the earth will testify against me. But he's disgusted. Basically, that racism, that tribalism is still inside him. He's looking at Bilal radiallahu anhu, standing on the Kaaba, calling the Adhan. And according to many of the scholars, that's where, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakrin wa unth- wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. The verse of Surah Al-Hujurat of Equality was revealed at that time. So Abu Sufyan swallows it. But he's still messed up, like he still has some, some concepts that are not right. This is not an easy Islam here. This is a very complicated case of Islam. Then what happens? Bilal, Ammar ibn Yasir, Suhaib al Rumi. They walk past Abu Sufyan on the day of Fatih Mecca. And they look at him and they say to him that, Wallahi, we swear by Allah. ما أخذت سيوف الله من عنق عدو الله ما أخذها. The swords of Allah did not reach the neck of the enemy of Allah like they should have. Like Abu Sufyan, you're lucky <laughs> we didn't get to you before the Prophet ﷺ let you go. Now, by the way, I mean, think about this. One of the beauties of this Subhanallah moment: all of the tortured slaves of Mecca lived to see the conquest of Mecca. They're there in Fatih Mecca, Subhanallah, and they're seeing the day of victory. And now. The elites that survived are under their power. Look how complicated this gets. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is thinking like the Prophet وسلم, about settling things down, calming down tensions. We need to win people's hearts to Islam here. We need to solve problems. 
We can't let this happen. So Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says to Bilal and Suhaib and Ammar, he says to them, أَتَقُولُونَ هَذَا لِشَيْخِ قُرَيْشِ وَسَيِّدِهِمْ Are you saying that to the leader of Quraysh, the elder of Quraysh, and their noble one? So when that happens, Abu Bakr comes to the Prophet and he tells the Prophet what happened. So do you understand what happened here? Bilal, Ammar, Suhaib, who were honored on the day of Mecca, on the day of Fatih Mecca, just threatened Abu Sufyan, who the Prophet forgave. Abu Bakr admonished Bilal and Suhaib and Ammar for speaking that way to Abu Sufyan. What do you think the Prophet is going to do here? The Prophet says to Abu Bakr, Ya Abu Bakr, لَعَلَّكَ أَغْبَطَّهُمْ لَإِن كُنْتَ أَغْبَطَّهُمْ لَقَدْ أَغْبَطَّ رَبَّكَ Oh Abu Bakr, you may have upset Bilal, Suhaib, and Ammar. And if you upset them, you may have upset your Lord. SubhanAllah, the Prophet وسلم, is trying to win the heart of Abu, of, of Abu Sufyan, but he's not going to diminish today Bilal and Suhaib and Ammar and those early. And this is the wisdom of the Prophet وسلم, the generosity of the Prophet وسلم, that we're not replacing as-sabiqun al-awwalun. We're not replacing these firsts who became Muslim and sacrificed everything with these leaders of Quraysh. Brothers, if you can move in, inshallah, ta, as much as possible so that those that are coming in uh, can sit, inshallah. We're not going to replace them this day. But at the same time, the Prophet وسلم, is trying to win their heart. So Abu Bakr goes back to Bilal and Ammar and Suhaib and he says to them, Ya ikhwata, aghabattukum? Did I aghdabtukum? Uh, Did I make you upset? Did I anger you, O oh, my brothers? And they said, La yaghfir Allahu lak. May Allah forgive you, O oh, our brother. You're Abu Bakr, of course, we're not mad at you. So Abu Bakr said, Alhamdulillah. So he had to make sure that he didn't upset Bilal and Suhaib and Ammar. Because the Prophet ﷺ understands what? That what Bilal and Ammar and Suhaib underwent at the hands of the likes of Abu Sufyan is not like what Abu Bakr underwent at the hands of Abu Sufyan. These are different people. The Prophet ﷺ understands that these are different types of emotions that he has to navigate. So subhanAllah, after that, the Prophet ﷺ enters into Mecca. Fatih Mecca takes place. The Prophet ﷺ attains his victory. Abu Sufyan's heart is, is, is settling into Islam. Why? Because he's seeing that the Prophet وسلم, all the skepticism he has about him is going away. In one narration, he says to the Prophet وسلم, uh, and Ibn Abbas anhu, anhuma says that the Muslims, كان المسلمون لا ينظرون إلى أبي Sufyan. The Muslims would not even look at Abu Sufyan. Like he was disgraced on that day. Even though the Prophet وسلم, forgave him, he still was kind of humiliated. Like everyone hated him, right? He was the chief enemy of the Muslims for all these years. So Abu Sufyan came to the Prophet وسلم, and he asked the Prophet وسلم, three things. He said, um, you know, uh, to affirm the marriage of Umm Habiba, which the Prophet وسلم, did, to take uh, Muawiyah, his son who was young at the time, عنه, to serve as a scribe, تجعله كاتبا بين يديك, he did. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, and make me a commander in the Muslim army so that I could fight for the Muslims the way I fought against the Muslims. Prophet ﷺ said, لَكَ ذلك. Okay. <laughs> and even the narrator of the hadith says that the Prophet ﷺ would not have given that to him had he not asked, but the Prophet ﷺ did not want to respond negatively to his asks. The Prophet ﷺ is conferring and he's seeing the situation as it's taking place in this regard. Hind bint Utba comes forth with the uh, wife of Ikram ibn Abi Jahl. Hind is terrified of what she's going to find from the Prophet ﷺ. She spit out the liver of his uncle Hamza, and no one was more beloved to the Prophet ﷺ than Hamza radiallahu anhu. I mean, put yourself in that situation. Like you think about Yusuf alayhi salam, and when the Prophet ﷺ said, "La tathrib alaykum al yom," and he's re repeating the words of Yusuf, he's also emanating the spirit of Yusuf. Like this is deep. This is not just like some people that did some bad things to you. This woman carved out and spit out the liver of your uncle. And you know what? The Prophet ﷺ received her with warmth. Marhaban. Welcome. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I seek your forgiveness for all that I've done in the past. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that you are the Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ immediately accepted it from her. No blame on you today. It's over. We're not going to have to go through this ever again. So, SubhanAllah, Abu Sufyan is forgiven. And he's starting to realize he's forgiven. Hind is forgiven. That this is not a game, that there's no loopholes to this, that there's nothing 
that is actually out of the ordinary to this. And he comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Fidaka abi wa ummi, wallahi innaka la kareem, wa laqad harabtuka, fa ni'ma muharibi kunt, thumma salamtuka, fa ni'ma musalimu ant, fa jazakallahu khayra. He says to the Prophet ﷺ, may my mother and my father be sacrificed for you. He said, what a noble man you are. I fought you and what a noble opponent you were in battle. And then I made peace with you and what a noble man you were in peace. Fajazakallahu khayra. May Allah reward you with good. What does this translate into? All of this, and again, you could have had a lot of people say, A'udhu billah, why are you treating Abu Sufyan like this? He's an enemy of Allah. We have to take revenge. What's going to be the outcome of this? Immediately after Fatih Mecca, Hunayn happens, the Battle of Hunayn. And these Bedouin tribes who are gathering up ambush a much larger army of the Muslims, but it gets very, very severe in battle. And guess what? As the Hawazin ambushed and many people fled the battlefield, the Prophet ﷺ looks to his right and to his left, and who does he find on the battlefield fighting right next to him? He finds Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He finds Al-Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He finds Abu Bakr and Umar. He finds Usama ibn Zayd, and then he finds Abu Sufyan refusing to leave his side on the battlefield and fighting courageously. You know the ayah, اِتْفَعْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌ حَمِيمٌ Respond to evil with that which is better. Your severe enemy will become your loving friend, your protective friend. This is that ayah. Abu Sufyan is a man of loyalty. He's got a certain mindset, a psychology to him. If at this point Islam hadn't settled in his heart, and if at this point he would have seen something from the Prophet ﷺ that was to his previous moral self, he would have been like, forget this, this is an opportunity. I'm going to join those guys, go back and take Mecca. But he stands guard with the Prophet ﷺ, despite, by the way, being almost 20 years older than the Prophet ﷺ. So he's old right now. And he fights until the very last moment, warding off the attack. After Hunayn, Ta'if happens. This is really going to blow your mind. <laughs> in Ta'if, he's next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi fighting, and he loses an eye in Ta'if. Abu Sufyan, who fought the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi all these years, had an eye that was plucked from him. And he comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi with an eye completely destroyed. And he says, Aini usibat fi sabilillah ya Rasulullah. My eye was cut for the sake of Allah, O Messenger of Allah. Prophet ﷺ says, إِن شِئْتَ دَعَوْتُ فَرَدَتُ عَلَيْكَ عَيْنُكَ If you want, I'll make dua and Allah will bring back your vision. He says, وَإِن شِئْتَ فَالْجَنَّةِ Abu Sufyan, if you desire, instead of this eye of yours, you'll get Jannah. He said, Al-Jannah. I'll take Jannah. See the shift in mindset? Same Abu Sufyan. <laughs> shift in mindset. I'll take Jannah. And the Prophet ﷺ gave him a hundred camels. And the Prophet ﷺ gave him 40 uqiyah of gold, a lot of the spoils of war. Now this will give you another perspective, another lens. Who did the Prophet ﷺ take the banner away from when they were coming into Mecca? Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, the leader of the Ansar. That famous incident. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah is the one who comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, Ya Rasulullah, look, some of the people are saying stuff. What is it, Ya Sa'ad? And he said, some of the Ansar are saying that now that you've come back to Mecca, you're going to leave us behind because of the spoils that you're giving to the people of Mecca that we're, you know, it's, it's done. And that's the famous gathering where the Prophet Sallallahu gathers the Ansar and he assures them that these people go home with their camels, with their sheep, with their money. You go home with Rasulullah Sallallahu This man, alayhi salatu wasalam, successfully managed and won the hearts of the Ansar Abu Sufyan, Abu Bakr, Bilal, Suhaib, all in the same incidents, that in and of itself is a sign that he's the Messenger of Allah. You know, Al-Qadi Ayyad says that if there was no other proof of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi except for his Sahaba, that's enough of a proof. This is it. <laughs> and of course, greater than that is the Qur'an. He managed to settle all of them and to get them all on the same page. I'm going to move forward, inshaAllah ta'ala, towards the end of this which is Abu Sufyan was commissioned to destroy Alat. <laughs> the same man that was shouting in the battlefield, Hubal Alat wal Uzza. He's one of those who goes and who destroys Alat, the idol, that he was once beating his chest over. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu appoints him as a leader of Najran, 
Abu Sufyan fought against the Murtadin, those that apostated. Again, if the Prophet hadn't treated him that way, if Islam didn't settle in his heart, don't you think he would have took it as an opportunity and just joined the ranks of the apostates and tried to retake power in Mecca? He fought against them. Then comes the time of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And again, it gets complicated. Umar radiallahu anhu doesn't like to play politics. Doesn't really care much about your feelings. So when the lines would take part in front of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu would arrange the lines in front of his house in accordance of what? The earliest people to embrace Islam get preference. So when you show up in front of the door of Umar, he literally judges the line by as sabiqun al-awalun, by the first. So all of you that became Muslim later, to the back of the line. I don't care who you are. So Abu Sufyan shows up to the door of Amir al-Mu'mineen and there is a relationship, there is lineage there, they're from that same sort of elite class. And Umar sends him to the back of the line. Bilal, Ammar, Suhaib are all up front. And Abu Sufyan is grumbling about being sent back to the line. Like this is, he's still not used to this. This is new. And that's when Suhail ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said to him, Ala anfusikum faghdibu. You guys should just be mad at yourselves. Du'iya al-qawm wa du'ina. That they were called and we were called. Fa'asra'u wa ata'na. They, were, they rushed to accept Islam. We were slow to embrace Islam. They took the door. We shut the door. Therefore, we have no one to be mad at except for ourselves. Accept it. So Abu Sufyan still has to kind of get used to this new reality. With that being said, what is the end of his life? And I'm sorry I went over time, subhanAllah, but it's truly profound. He went out to Asham as a mujahid fi sabirillah. He's one of those people who just knows the battlefield. He knows... He's a leader. He has to be a leader. The Prophet ﷺ gave him a leadership position. Abu Bakr gave him a leadership position. Umar gave him a leadership position in the battlefield. But he was very old. And he's fighting in the battle of Yarmouk under Khalid. This battle where all of those leaders of Quraysh, subhanAllah, are going to, many of them will die as shuhada, will die as martyrs. Their akhlaq have been completely refined. Their noble manners are now on full display. And Abu Sufyan, on the battle of Yarmouk was fighting under the banner of his son, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan. Not to be confused for Yazid ibn Muawiyah, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan. And as he was fighting under the banner of his son, he was calling out, he was seen calling out on the day of Yarmouk, Ya Nasrallah iqtarib, O victory of Allah, come near. Allah, Allah, innakum ansarul Islam, wa daratul Arab. Allah, Allah, you are the helpers of Islam, the pride of the Arabs. Wa ha'ula ansarul shirk, wa daratul rum. These people are the helpers of polytheism and the pride of the Romans. Allahumma hadha yawmun min ayyamik. Allahumma anzil nasrak. Oh Allah, this is a day from your days. Oh Allah, let your victory come upon us. Let your help come upon us. And the Muslims won, but guess what? Abu Sufyan was struck in his other eye. So subhanAllah, both of his eyes were struck fi sabirillah. Same man that used all those years of his life planning against Islam. And when he passes away, he dies close to the age of 100 years old in the Khilafah of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his cousin, in al Madina, his daughter Umm Habiba radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu is the one who uh, basically carried out the rituals surrounding his death and that, you know, uh, taught through her own experience how to grieve the loss of a parent. And here he is in Medina now, Salatul Janaza in Medina on Abu Sufyan. It is one of the weirdest moments in history for people. Think about it. Abu Sufyan held this city under siege and tried to kill us all. And now he's being prayed Janaza upon in Medina and being buried in Al-Baqir. Abu Sufyan, who once was shouting out like a maniac, just a few miles away in Uhud, U'lu Hubal, may Hubal be exalted, has Uthman saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and burying him amongst the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. What does it show you, dear brothers and sisters? The power of redemption, the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. Ya muqallib al-qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. May Allah turn, may Allah keep our hearts firm on his path and turn the hearts even of people that we think are impossible to have their hearts turned. And that's why you don't give up on your da'wah and you show your noble ethics with that da'wah. And inshallah ta'ala next week, with the night ta'ala, we're actually going to talk about the other Abu Sufyan. There's an interesting thing that some of the Sahaba, when they're named after someone, 
Like Uthman ibn Mad'un and Uthman ibn Affan, they get overshadowed. There's another Abu Sufyan that we'll talk about next week, inshallah, who is actually closer to the Prophet ﷺ. We ask Allah to be pleased with the companions, to forgive us for our shortcomings, and we ask Allah to join us with our beloved Messenger ﷺ, Fifridaus al-A'la, Allahumma ameen. Jazakum Allah khaira, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.